Hello, and welcome to the Raven Conversations podcast. I'm Jason Kreis from the Public Affairs Office on Camp Murray. From time to time on the show, we would like to spotlight the wide variety of MOSs and AFSCs that are available in the Washington National Guard. If you don't know what those are, those are jobs and career fields in which soldiers and airmen can serve our beloved state and nation. We will have a guest on who is in a certain job field to talk all about it, what it's like, and what people can look forward to if they are interested in going that route in their careers. Today, we are going to bring you the first of these kinds of episodes. Before battles are fought and targets are destroyed, critical information needs to be gathered about our adversaries in order for our military leaders to make informed decisions. The majority of that information is gathered from foreign language sources. Sarah Morris and I sat down with two sergeants in the 341st Military Intelligence Battalion. Staff Sergeants David Larson and Kurt Erickson are both intelligence professionals with foreign language skills. Larson speaks Japanese and Erickson speaks Russian. We talk about how they train and excel in their language, the different countries they've traveled to for language immersion training, the valuable world-class education they receive at the Defense Language Institute, and most importantly, how they use their language to gather the vital foreign intel needed to make critical wartime decisions. But the intel analyst field is not just for the Army side of the National Guard. There is an intelligence squadron in the Air National Guard who do similar work. Enjoy the conversation. It's a good one. But I want to take a moment to talk about public affairs. Public affairs is a fundamental tool to connect our military to the civilian communities that we serve. Through communicating your unit's story to the public, your unit will get the attention of senior leaders who make decisions and the support of the public at large. Public affairs professionals in the Washington National Guard work really hard to tell the story of the Army and the Air Force through compelling imagery, stories and articles, and now through this podcast, as well as through traditional news media like television and newspapers. Whether it's through a reporter or using social media, we provide the training, guidance, access, and the tools necessary to get your story out to the world. Give us a call at 253-512-8989 or just send us an email. You can find the email in the show notes. Thank you, and now I give you today's conversation. Well, anyways, let's get started. So we're here with uh, Staff Sergeant Kurt Erickson. Yes. And Staff Sergeant, still Staff Sergeant? Okay. Yes. Um, Dave Larson. Correct. And you both are with the 341st Military Intelligence Battalion, and you are both linguists. linguists. That's correct. <laughs> correct. Yay. All right. So uh, first, let's just start with you, Sergeant Larson, and then we'll just tell me a little bit about yourself. I joined the Washington Guard in 2009, transferred into the 341st, and uh, spent a few years getting into some schools, eventually ending up in uh, a Defense Language Institute, studying Japanese in 2012. So I've been <laughs> graduated from there late 2013. It's a 16-month course, and uh, it's been maintaining my language since then. Uh, 35 Mike, human intelligence collector, uh, 35 Fox analyst, uh, deployment, done a couple missions to Asia and uh, Middle East and uh, currently work in the S3 section for the battalion. So. All right, so um, Staff Sergeant Kurt Erickson, I started off on active duty um, in 09 as infantry and um, served mo the majority of that time um, either as a sniper or as a sniper team leader. Uh, deployed to Afghanistan um, in 2012, 2013 in that role um, served on in Second Striker Brigade on North Fort uh, on, on Joint Base Lewis McCord. So, so JBLM and this area pretty much have been my one and only significant duty station. Um, and then um, made Staff Sergeant I think 24, early 2014, and then transitioned over to the Washington National Guard. February 2015 was my first drill, uh, with the intent of becoming a, a cryptologic linguist. So uh, that transition from active duty to, to guard uh, within the 341st has been wonderful for me. Um, I had um, um, Spanish language skill going back to when I was a civilian. Um, I worked in the wine industry for several years and used it on a regular basis. And I was kind of what you'd call a 2-2 Spanish linguist. Um, so not fluent, but, but a certain level of working proficiency. 
and then, uh, but I joined the Guard to become a Russian linguist. And the beauty about uh, of that is in the Guard, you generally have a chance to choose what language you're going you're gonna to specialize in if you don't already come in with, with um, fluency in another language. And, um, and so I went to the Defense Language Institute in 2017 and graduated in March of last year and, um, and have, have been working uh, as an instructor for the Washington Regional Counter Drug Training Center. Uh, but uh, a cryptologic linguist basically is a signals intelligence analyst who has linguistic capability. So let's talk about this in intelligence analyst. Like, what kind of stuff do you guys do in that realm? So the capabilities, I can, um, I can give you the watered down version of what we can discuss. Yeah. Um, so we have um, uh, a couple different missions. Some are tactical and some are strategic, where we have the ability to legally collect um, signals, emissions from certain emitters, whether they be uh, over the radio or uh, in certain instances via email or cell phone, whatnot, to legally be able to collect that, analyze it, and as a, and and those who have linguistic capability, then will be translating that over to from their target language, in my case Russian um, or Japanese, into our language into, into English um, so they can be consumed and turned into actionable intelligence. Okay. Right. Right. Pretty se separate from that in a human capacity, the language would mostly be used for one-on-one uh, -on -one or small group uh, interactions with foreign uh, either usually allies, in my case with Japanese, I'll go over and support training missions or if the self-defense force from Japan comes over will support in liaise between, a lot of times it's with the First Corps and the Japanese Self-Defense Force. And we just act as either translators mm -hmm. or cultural advisors of some sort. Uh, it's a little different from intelligence collection, but it, it, it helps bring together uh, assets. And understand that human intelligence collection is the oldest method of gathering information. It's always existed. It will always exist. Uh, the better you are at it, um, I mean, we have had some ebb and flow in, in the history of the United States military on our, on our, on our ability to collect human intelligence. Uh, I think we are once, hopefully again, trending up in that, in that, in that sphere. Um, but um, um, basically, uh, if, if all technology fails, right. you go back to human. So what are the, s some of the training opportunities that you've had since you join the guard and to use your language. I mean, you've given an example about like with the Japanese counterparts and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So if you could just give us some of your experiences using your training uh, in the real world. Okay. Um, throughout the year, every year, we're at 341st is always sending somebody somewhere. Um, training missions or real life missions. Uh, most of our languages have an opportunity to go somewhere and use their language ability uh, in conjunction with their intel capacity or just the language aspect. Um, supporting missions uh, with partner countries like Thailand, the uh, Philippines, Korea, Japan, and then uh, Eastern Europe as well. Some of the different missions that are ongoing there will have soldiers go out and support in one way or another. Uh, more Locally, at least uh, in domestic aspects, we have training opportunities with uh, immersions, which your yeah. Sergeant Erickson is currently in one uh, here on JBLM. Otherwise, we send soldiers to, uh, I want to say Concordia in Minnesota for language immersions. Salt Lake City has uh, schools at University of Utah, I believe. That's correct. Um, not so much with going back to DLI, although that's an option for advanced courses and um, some additional skills, but uh, la that's language specific. Uh, I don't know if you have anything. And then we can really highlight things like overseas immersions, which are yeah. a big focus going forward. Um, once you become a military linguist, you are responsible to maintain your skill set in that language. And that's really, really key. And in fact, we don't, you don't want to simply maintain it. You want to accelerate and improve. 
So if you're like, like I was with Spanish at a 2-2 level, we want to get you to a higher level of working proficiency, perhaps even fluency, right? And one of the best ways to do that is to simply immerse yourself in the culture and the language. It is the, it, you just soak things up like a sponge. And, um, and your ability to, to retain that information and that cultural awareness um, will stick with you for a much lengthier period of time. And so every year, um, the 341st sends their personnel either to a local, what they call an, an ISO immersion, which may be held on the, at the Foreign Language Training Center here at, on Joint Base Lewis McCord. I'm attending one right now, pretty much the entire month of January. Um, or routinely, we will send people to the, um, uh, the Partner Language Training Center in Europe, which is in um, Garmisch, Southern Germany, which is a fantastic place to go. Um, and then also other fantastic opportunities overseas. As an example, when you are working at the Defense Language Institute, if you are a, um, a highly rated student, you may have an opportunity to do an overseas immersion. I did one in Latvia in um, the fall of 2017 for an entire month. Those as a student at DLI? As a student nice. at DLI, right? So what a fantastic opportunity. You might be, so you're still uh, at that point what you'd call an initial entry training soldier. You haven't even gotten necessarily to your unit. So if you're a new soldier coming into the Guard, you might go through basic training and then go to the Defense Language Institute for a year or more to study your language, be able to go overseas for a month, work at a foreign university, you get college credit for that, right? Then you come back, right? <laughs> wink, wink, college. nudge, nudge, yeah. right? Sounds great. Um, and then you would come to your guard unit and continue your education, right? right. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, places like Dog Off Pills in Latvia, that is, it is well known as the most Russian city in all of the European Union. And it's true, 80, 85 to 90 percent of the inhabitants there speak Russian as a first language. So it is no better place where we can go uh, within the, the limits of our, our you know, um, you Ability. abilities, frankly, to have, to have American students, uh, members of the Department of Defense, go study. So it's so a really great it's, opportunity. It's key to get the cultural understanding because otherwise people rely on direct translation, which usually does not work. Right. Right. We had katusas when I was in Korea and they would actually ask me the meaning behind a lot of the words we were using because there was a different variation yes. that they yeah. would tr then translate for the, the Korean uh, army counterparts. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that whole like understanding mm -hmm. of like how they're using the words, I think that's mm -hmm. crucial. And, and another thing to, to <coughs> piggyback off that, it, it, um, Sergeant Larson was talking a lot about maybe the, the Pacific Command, PACOM, right. the, 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 you know, the Pacific Rim countries. Um, a lot of us also work very, very closely with NATO partners. And, and that is so vital to, um, to strengthening and building and maintaining our alliances overseas. You know, as you've seen um, more countries join the ranks of NATO because they've wanted to be a part of that organization, they then want U.S. military service members there. It might be Poland, it might be Romania, it might be Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. There are reasons why they want partners there. In order to be effective partners with them, we need to be able to communicate. Even if, even if not, not to say anything against your language ability, but even if Sergeant Erickson went over and was working with their partner forces in Eastern Europe, just the willingness to have a person who's able to speak the language um, goes a long ways. That, that was my case in Japan the first time I went there for, to do language support. My ability wasn't nearly what I wanted it to be. They had translators that their English ability was amazing, but just the fact that we had people there went a long way. Like, just more than... Willing to even try. Exactly. So. And another wonderful thing is uh, there are opportunities overseas to go TDY for temporary duty where um, even if you are in a, a military occupational specialty, an MOS that has nothing to do with military intelligence, you might be an aircraft mechanic, you might be an infantryman, you might be in supply, but you, speak, you have another language, a second or third language that you speak fluently in your home and you're fluent, maybe it's Tagalog, maybe it's Japanese, maybe it's Chinese, maybe it's Swahili, maybe it's French. You can s and maintain your career in your current MOS, but then when a call goes out saying, hey, we have a mission going to West Africa, who speaks French, who speaks Swahili, who speaks a local dialect that's valuable to us? 
right? Who, if, if we're going to Morocco, who can speak Arabic, right? A, a French and Arabic speaker there would be, a, would be gold, right. right? Literally worth their weight in gold. Especially if someone can do both. Right, mm -hmm. and so you might be able to tack on to a mission like that and go serve your country for a significant period of time, get a great opportunity to, to see a part of the world you'd never otherwise visit, um, and you're, you're getting to go because you have that language skill. And not only, not only that, you were, we were talking on the phone yesterday where you mentioned there's a monetary incentive to maintaining another language. Can you go into that a little it's bit? It's a significant one too, right? As an example, so, so I have qualifying DLPT scores. So basically a defense language proficiency test scores. I have qualifying scores in three languages and, and, and they're in different categories. Russian is what's called, um, um, it's like a legacy language where it doesn't matter what your MOS is, you're going to get paid for it per month. Then there are emerging languages, and then there are languages where you get paid um, if you are in a duty position that requires that language, right? So Spanish is one of those. Um, you can earn up to $400 a month per language and up to a cap of $1,000 per month. So what that means is, Say you're an M-Day soldier, you're a weekend warrior type of National Guardsman, and you literally work two to three days a month, right? right? The military and the Department of Defense will pay you simply for having that language skill. So if you're an E3, a private first class, you might clear $200, $250 a month, maybe, on a normal, for, on your, because of your normal drill days. Right. But then because you speak Russian or Chinese or Hindi, or Swahili, you might make another $400 on top of that, regardless of whether you work three days a month or whether you work 30 days a month. Wow. So you may That's more awesome. than double your take home pay, right? So understand over the course of your career how much extra money that can be. Oh, yeah. And uh, it can really, really be significant. And there is an incentive to then pick up additional languages. Right. Do you guys think that it's hard for an adult to pick up another language? Do you think it takes a certain kind of person to speak multiple languages? I think yourself? the number one thing it takes is just the willingness to work really hard because well, it is not okay. easy. Uh, Defense Language Institute in Monterey is one of the premier language schools in the world and that's yeah. my experience and that's probably... Completely agree. But they will raise the bar mm -hmm. high as they can for each individual. Um, but I can tell you as an old infantryman, I'm not that bright. It's just that simple, okay? God bless you guys, it's, it's just, but, uh, but I learned Russian at the age of 37. Yeah. So if I can do it, that means a lot of other people can too, right. Yeah. all right? Um, and so it comes down to work ethic. It comes down to understanding how you learn. If you understand your learning style, then, and, and I'm a very auditory, out loud type of person, so I like a classroom environment where there's a lot of interaction. I will sponge that information up. That's why I love immersions, right? Mm -hmm. um, so if you understand how you learn, you can, you can learn anything. And if you have a good solid work ethic and are willing to put the effort in every day and come in, like we say to a lot of young soldiers, what do I need out of you? I need you to be in the right place at the right time with a halfway decent attitude. And as an NCO, I'll take you the rest of the way. That halfway decent attitude or better will, will get you there. And <clears throat> one, of, one of the things you hit on earlier, um, Separate from my experience with maybe some of the active components who have language capabilities versus our, our guard um, battalion, in this case uh, 341st, the languages we have, we really want to give the soldier the language they want versus just what we need. I mean, obviously within a certain parameters, we'll, right. we'll want them to have something we need, but because it's on the soldier to maintain the language on their, mostly on their own time in the guard. Um, they have to be interested in that language because yeah. it's, it's a challenge, you gotta find the time, but we do have plenty of resources available through our battalion, um, electronic, um, hardware, lots of books, magazines, programs. Uh, that's just things that people can use above and beyond the, the training and immersions. And every unit that has linguists has what's called a command language program manager, CLPM. And so that's the person or persons to go to um, for resources. And the resources available today, as Sergeant Larson mentioned, are far, far better than they were in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s. Yeah, because there's so many fantastic apps out there 
that you can use. So many of us have smartphones and, and you, can, um, you can be streaming language skill sets. Um, you, know, you can download apps for, I, get, I, li, I, I read Russian news every day. I read Ukrainian news every day. I'm sitting there in immersion and my, and my instructors are, are showing us the news of the day in Russia and I've already read it in two languages. So I'm like, yeah, I already read that story, sorry. They're like, darn it, Erickson. But, um, but uh, there's no reason not to. And there's another really wonderful program for linguists called CL150. Uh, that's a great app that literally sends you um, time sensitive and current le lessons in your target language every week, right? And they're easy to complete and they're fun and they're interactive. And, um, and so, and, and the higher your level gets, then the higher the, the difficulty level that they send you. Mm -hmm. So it's appropriate to your, your need set. What does a normal drill weekend look like for the traditional M-Day linguist? I can speak on that. I, um, I, I get to spend most of my time in the battalion area, so I'm not the best to answer that question. Right. I mean, he's one of the people that keeps the battalion running, right? right? Mm -hmm. But I'm lucky in that um, I have a different day job than what I do during the M-Day. And so I would say, say throughout the course of a calendar year, you might have 11 drills. There's usually one month where there's no drill, like it might be the holidays or something, right? So four to five of those are really going to be focused on language maintenance, okay? Um, we all, if those of us who have clearances, which is the majority of our unit, uh, um, uh, also have to maintain those as well. And, uh, but the, the nice thing is uh, many of us are working, literally working on missions that matter around the world. Because this, the, the, the intelligence that I talked about gathering earlier can be collected and I can work on it from, from Washington State if I have the, pro the appropriate access. And I can actually go in and make a difference. Not just me, but many of people in our, in our unit. And you don't have to be a full-time National Guardsman to do that. There are missions where you can come in and work for a certain three-letter agency at different points depending upon what the mission might be. Uh, but you also will be doing language maintenance. So we have these wonderful programs where what are called cohort training, where all of the Spanish linguists, all the Russian linguists, all the Korean or Chinese or Arabic linguists or Farsi linguists all get together and they design training for each other. Um, so you might have a cohort lead who this month we're going to be doing cohort training specifically on like military skill sets, right? So I remember when I was at DLI, I wrote a, a, a scenario where um, you had a four person team. One person was kind of embedded on the ground gathering military intel, notional military intelligence from a, 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 a terrain model, right? right? Uh, at, and, and watching as, as units moved around the battle space. And that person's job was to report that information up to their, their tactical operations center. Then he had another translator who was gaining access to intercepts in the target language. And they had to translate those into English very accurately. Then another person had to basically build what we call a blue force tracker, right? Uh, which is where all the good guys are on the map and then try and find out where all the bad guys are on the map, right? And it trains real skills. And then the commander is asked to answer things like their priority intelligence requirements, the things that we need to know about the enemy in order to be effective, and the things we need to know about ourselves in order to give us the best chance to win in a battle, right? And ask, uh, and so we would do training like that during a cohort on a weekend where we might be in teams of four, you come in and you're going for 90 minutes, you're going to be immersed in this, in this, in this task. And, and you have a time, time hacks uh, of things that you have to answer and, um, and so on. And it makes it, it puts pressure on the soldiers. Um, it makes them use their skill set and their language. Um, but uh, those types of weekends are a lot of fun. A lot better than mandatory training. <laughs> yeah, indeed. We still got to do those. Though. Yeah. We, we get that, we too. We, we are actually running around the idea of trying to do some of those in language, though. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, that would be really cool. So we get I mean, to I don't know about really cool, but at least, <laughs> at least it very makes useful. makes it maybe a little bit more interesting, yeah. anyway. Yeah, so. more unique. And different, <laughs> at least. You'd have to try harder to yeah. um, prepare and you know, pay attention. And exactly. You'd but have to uh, actually like, build slides. <laughs> 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 but... Uh, yeah, the, the uh, 
the training aspect of language, we, d we do run into the, the small challenges based on how many languages we have. Like, so um, the cohorts is key because it breaks it down into a language specific uh, piece of training. And then we have uh, cohort leads Correct. that prepare certain training depending on uh, the focus for that, for that drill. And that command language program manager I was talking about earlier, they might be the, the overall manager of that cohort. So the lead for each cohort, say the, the Farsi cohort lead, would, would send the CLPM what their plan is for that month. And then we would all, as cohort leads, get to see what the other guys are doing. So if somebody has a really great idea in the Chinese cohort, then maybe the Russian cohort can adapt and, ad and adopt that to their language the next time we get together. So then we end up kind of making each other better. That's, a, you know, kind of a u utopian idea, but it does work. <laughs> <laughs> so within the confines of, you know, unclassified, what kind of stuff, actionable stuff, you said you earlier that stuff you were working on intelligence that makes a difference mm -hmm. in, in real world missions. Yes. Is there anything you can say about generally what it is that you're working on? Yeah, do you see, did you see uh, us kind of bristle a little bit, right? Because yeah, yeah. we have a lot to protect. Right, well, for, yeah, so, for sure. Um, but what we can just, say... Just ongoing things. Yeah. So... That <laughs> what's you what's may may so about. from the outside looking in from the outside looking in it's very interesting now as uh, a member of the intelligence community and let's let's un understand that when you enter into this role and you um, you become either a 35 papa a 35 Mike um, or a 35 Lima which are, are, are positions available within our battalion that's a counterintelligence agent a human intelligence collector or cryptologic linguist, you are now for the rest of your life kind of ha have indoctrinated into the, the military intelligence community. Um, you are privy to information where when you read it on BBC or you read it on CNN or you hear about it on Fox News, mm -hmm. they will have the sanitized version mm -hmm. and you may just have worked on, on exactly that mission and you might actually know what really happened. You may not be able to talk about it, right. and in fact, you probably won't be able to talk about it, but the media will have a sanitized version of it, hopefully, right? Um, but, um, the open source. But, but as an example, when a drone strike takes place in Yemen mm -hmm. on a terrorist who we know and who may, who, who may have in absentia been convicted for being involved in, say, like, the bombing of the USS Cole back in 1990. Mm -hmm. there, there are people who are in our roles who are responsible or have, some, have played a role in things like that. Right. When, when an Osama bin Laden, when it's discovered that an Osama bin Laden is hiding in a place like Abbottabad, Pakistan, mm -hmm. there are people who work in our roles who have done the number crunching and the analysis to find out where that man was hiding for so long and why and how. Past Is that clear? Events. Past <laughs> events are safe. Yeah. <laughs> They're already in the open right? source. Yeah. Kind of getting it. Okay. So. Yeah. I mean, so when I worked for the CJ Flick, that's the combined forces land component command. Combined joint mm -hmm. forces land component command operation inherent resolve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I understand Operation Air Resolve, sure. Yep, uh, Iraq and Syria now. Uh, just Iraq when I was there. Um, airstrikes, right? So our job as the Public Affairs Office, we would release um, any releasable information about what strikes happened and what strikes, um, if we had any video that was worthwhile. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, whatever. But. Obviously, that was the stuff that we got to tell everyone, but we mm -hmm. were also involved in seeing, like, not the whole process, obviously, because we weren't going to sit in the skiff for, like, a million years. <laughs> but we would uh, be able to see sort of, like, the intelligence process of, like, this is how we I identify this is, like, a target, and these are the reasons why we think that this is a great target and stuff right. like that. And then we would get to explain to the media, like, well, here here's our reasoning, like we're not going to go into the details, but we do have these different kinds of intelligence and information that has been gathered over <laughs> more than the course of like five right. minutes, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and we made a, an educated 
and very purposeful mm -hmm. strike. And I guess right. that's like and so the much other of side of what everybody gets to see. Nobody really gets to see what you guys are doing right. in the background, except for maybe those of us that get to watch the whole process because we have yeah. to know what's happening because when it does happen, we're going to be responsible for telling them why it happened. And so much of the value of this analysis is not so much about launching that strike. Right. It's about uh, who who doesn't deserve to have a strike launched on them, right? Because now we're able to discern through analysis and through gathering information properly and building intelligence packages out of it that this is this person is or these people are not responsible for right. this, right? So we don't do um, uh, we don't make a, 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 a series of mistakes exactly. that lead to the wrong person being being hit, right? Um, as a as a sniper and a sniper team leader, I was often the recipient and the consumer of well-built intelligence packages, right? Um, but I was also gathering it. And so now uh, it's interesting to kind of have it come full circle where I can be the person who's providing that analysis to people on the battlefield so that the guy behind the rifle, the best decisions I ever made as a sniper were the ones where I chose not to fire. Right. Right. And and so you end up you end up saving lives and 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 um, preventing bad things from happening. Exactly. That's what really about that's what you know pr you know protecting democracy is all about. You don't protect democracy by killing the wrong people. Exactly. Right. So it's fascinating it's stuff. It's really cool is. to watch the whole yeah. process. I mean, over obviously just a large span of time, mm. but it is it is definitely interesting to see see the process. Mm. I think you guys get to like live it, but yeah. even just to see it is cool. <laughs> and it's really cool that it's in the National Guard, right? In yeah. in Washington State, where you know we can do this part time and mm -hmm. still make a difference. And that's what I think a lot of people don't know is that they think all of this happens in the other Washington. Right. The Washington that yes. in some cases doesn't work all that well for us sometimes. Right. Um, this Washington, right, case in point, right, it's here we are day 26 or 27 of a government partial shutdown. But um, in this Washington, we have the ability to contribute. And uh, uh, even from, from Joint Base Lewis McCord or Anywhere in the anywhere in the world where our personnel are sent, they are force multipliers. And in Washington State, too, a population that's pretty varied as far as cultural backgrounds and language uh, that they speak. I mean, what we, an I've asset seen, that is! Yeah, yeah, I've seen the the diagrams of the the different languages and the extraordinary amount of languages that there are here in Washington State. So I I would assume that yeah being a linguist here is a there, big time deal. There's been more more than a few um, instances where we've been approached by agencies within the state, either educational or law enforcement, requesting our assistance in translating, providing products, um, just either quick guidebooks for police officers to be able to speak to foreign language speakers, right. um, just little things like that. So it, it is nice to have the opportunity to use your language ability to assist within the state locally, right. as well as uh, the traditional more military mission. A lot of people that's, you know, you, want, you join the guard versus the reserve uh, active duty. There's certain reasons that right. like point us in one direction or another, but it's nice to be local. As well. In the event of a natural disaster, you know, if, if we had a significant earthquake tsunami concern, right, we're gonna have, we're gonna have populations that are affected all along the western seaboard all throughout the Puget Sound perhaps, right? And in certain communities, you know, say we're going to go to the International District in Seattle yeah. and 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 y you take only English speakers into that community, are you going to bet are you going to best serve that community not necessarily. Mm -hmm. You know? Um, and so and so if you can take a contingent of of um, of individuals who have foreign language capability, Chinese linguists or whatever the the ethnic group might be, um, and then, of course, we can. Um, um, we also have the capability, certainly, to assist in things like wildfires, and 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 which are obviously are a big deal in this part of the country every every summer. So. So, what's the uh, for you guys personally? What's the best part about being a linguist? 
the the for me it's the ability to um, increasingly understand a foreign uh, culture because there's there's just certain things about I, I lived in Japan before I was in the army as a teacher um, I lived there as a child oh, okay so <laughs> you know y you get a you get a, a perspective when you're in that environment but I had no language ability and the, the company I worked for actually wanted that because they wanted me to provide an immersive English experience to my mm -hmm. students uh, now when I go over you know I, I can read the kanji anywhere um, you know, just see the signs, read the advertisements, interact with people. And um, it's just, you know, 15 years ago, I never would have thought I'd be able to do it. Right. I, you know, it didn't enter my mind. So nice. um, to be able to go through that, that process is, it's right. work, when but I'm it's good. At a restaurant, yeah. Which is important. <laughs> well, especially in Japan. Yeah, you <laughs> bet. Yeah. There's some exotic foods available. Some exotic food. Indeed. Yeah, you might be I missing out on one or two really good things if, yeah. you know. I but mean, so I lived there, I lived in uh, Okinawa. My mom was in the Air Force. Okay. So I lived there for two and a half years, second and third grade. So we had a teacher who would bring us food. His wife was Japanese. They taught us Japanese, but I mean, it was limited to um, basic phrases and, and letters. But I hardly retained any of that, but I still remember very vividly all of the food, and uh, obviously the culture, which is incredible, um, but not very much the language. Mm. <laughs> that definitely went away. And, and that's important fact. Mm -hmm. It's a perishable skill, so if, if, we, um, if we don't work to maintain it, we lose certain aspects of it. Um, at the Defense Language Institute, they do a great job giving you a lot um, depending on where you focus after that some things are a little easier to maintain some things are going to take a little bit more time i know you, you graduated less than a year ago so a little over a year ago now i don't know if you've experienced any fall off oh or no still less than a year ago you're right my yeah. heavens um but it, i mean my it seems like time has really flown um but um because a lot in my life has changed since becoming qualified in, in Russian. I mean, so many opportunities have become available to me that, that there were, the doors opened up where I didn't even know a door existed. Right. It's one thing if you know a door is there and it's closed to you. It's another thing, once, this, once you become qualified in another language, how many opportunities open up to you? And, and that is what, to answer the, to, to answer the question that you posed, um, that is one of the reasons why our battalion does actually have a fair amount of turnover because people with our skill set are so sought after in the private sector and elsewhere in the government sector as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are people that come in who become really, really good at the languages and almost pretty much write their own ticket um, on where they want to go and what they want to do. Um, but another great answer to that question is it's a lifetime of learning. Learning does not stop at the end of high school or at the end of college or at the end of the Defense Language Institute training. It's an ongoing, lifelong thing. And so if you believe in a lifetime of learning and you want to keep your mind sharp, learn another language. Challenge yourself. doesn't matter what age you are, right? Um, because we'll find the De Department of Defense will test you. You'll take the Defense Language Aptitude Battery, and that test will tell you whether you've got the aptitude to learn a new language or not. And if you get a good enough score, you can go learn pretty much any language the Defense the Department of Defense can teach you, um, no matter of your age. And uh, so that, for me, is, has been um, career opportunity, but then just the enrichment of one's soul to be able to, to learn how other people live. And, and again, the goodwill that you build. You know, we'll talk about being able to do, uh, do good diplomacy, right, and, and spread democracy and spread economic opportunity. You can do that. You can't do that unless you can communicate. But if you can communicate a little bit, the amount of goodwill that you generate is returned to you tenfold. So. Do you have anything else? No, I. I'm, I'm so I think we're going to wrap it up. But before we end this, I want each of you to tell me what you had for breakfast. And if you didn't have something for breakfast, what you had for lunch in your language. Oh yeah, that's a good one. Uh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and what was that? Uh, I, I had two hard-boiled eggs, and that's it.
That's it? Okay. Yeah. Já kušel očin vkusný oběd sevodně. Da um, naši instru- instruktori, naši předavatelníci i um, naši studenti mi um, přigatovili um, i, i sjeli v městě uh, na oběd. Uh, um, o oh, boršt, očin vkusný svěží boršt, um, 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 jablčný uh, pirošky, co uh, ještě? O oh, um, um, sirom. I što je šo? Um, uh, o, 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 očin vkusni hleb, takže i uh, kinešna um, čaj. I što je šo? Ja zabil. Translated into English, that was cereal, right? Nijet. No. <laughs> um, so basically... But you're, you're, um, you're in an immersion though. So. I'm in an immersion, so I was really lucky. Today was the day where we all brought in Russian food. Oh, that's why you had right? borscht. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. And we had yeah. gone to, some of us had gone right. to a local um, Eastern European and Russian market and brought in food for lunch. So we had borscht, we had, we had um, a poroshki, right? Um, and, uh, and, and oh, very, and very tasty um, um, fresh salad and, um, and then of course coffee and tea. Right. Uh, it was a really wonderful meal. Did catch the chai like as well. Mm. <laughs> right. Chai, poroski, yeah, is just tea. I wanna, I wanna it was a good day. Ya bil ochin I was very yeah. satisfied. If you want another language for the food, <laughs> I cannot recommend Japanese enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, still dream some good of it. stuff. Thank you very much for joining us today, and um, wish you luck in your lifelong learning of another language. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.